morning. Morning. Pray for Jerry. Jerry's been a wonderful friend in the last forty years. He has been a, a steady friend. I, I remember when uh, I was ordained a, a deacon. Uh, in the 1970s, you, you have three years of, uh, of a deacon's orders, two years, and then you, 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 you ordain elder. But if he ordained the elder, I would be the first ethnic minority preacher in North Georgia. And of course, at those days, that couldn't happen. And so, Jerry, uh, became my friend. And he uh, just loved me and talked to me and, and helped me to understand what's going on in culture. And, and, uh, and uh, I remember I went into uh, a bank uh, to, to, to borrow some money to buy a house. And the men said to me that I had no uh, credit. And so, <laughs> and he laughed at me and, uh, and said, sir, you don't have no, no uh, there's another word for credit there. Oh, yeah, that's the word. You have no collateral. And of course, I asked Jerry, what is that? And she said, you don't have any money. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I had a phone call from uh, Lord Stephen Schuderholm the next afternoon. And so I went to, to Lord Stevens to play the guitar to, and, uh, and, and make $25. And I remember that uh, I, I suddenly, the, when I got, came in, there was an older man in a black suit and a boy. That's all. And of course his wife was in the casket. And so I sang the Lord's Prayer with a guitar and it's a Brazilian way to play the guitar, very, very guitar more than anything else, fast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I sat down and he came to me and said, sing it again. And I sang it one more time. And then when I finished it, sing it again. And I sang a third time. And uh, it went home. And the next day I had a call from Athens first. He said, I don't know what's going on, sir, but you need to come here real quick. Mr. Harold. You need to come here real quick, real quick, fast as has effect. But when I got down there, he said, uh, you've been approved. And so I, I looked at the paper and I turned the paper the other day, and he said, Mr. Griffith, Griffith, whatever, I don't remember the first sight, but it was Griffith. And he, and he said, give this boy the loan on his voice, you pay it. <laughs> and of course, I, I, I was given, uh, and he was the one in the funeral home. <laughs> And of course, I got the loan. It was at 152 Spalding Court, University Heights. And it wasn't for Jerry, I would never be able to understand collateral. <laughs> so Jerry's been a wonderful friend. He gave me my first computer that I worked in the basement. And I put names there. And he would come and pray for me during the hard times. You know, I was an evangelist, uh, a deacon. By the way, I stayed deacon for seven years. Bishop Ken really knew what I had to do in order to become an evangelist. So the seventh year, he ordained me an elder. And the funny thing is that I had an outfit they put on me. They had a train behind me. You know, there's, a, there's more dress on the floor than on the me. And so every time uh, Jerry asked me to preach or do something or talk to him, I, uh, I remember the wonderful times that we had together and still do. Would you open your Bible in Acts chapter 1? And I want to read uh, verse 9, verse 8 and 9. And, and that should do it. Well, a little more than that. Let me just read something. Amen. Let's stand together to the reading of God's scripture. Acts 1 9. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, 
and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they're looking steadfast toward heaven, as you and I, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from, from you into heaven shall so come in the like manner as you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, where abode both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, all the sons of Alphaeus, Simon, Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, that uh, we have a new year before us, and we are expectant of your presence, Lord, and your direction, your purpose. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that this morning you be with us in this word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm about to head to Peru on the 14th of January, and, uh, and I'm in touch with the American Embassy, in touch with the bishop, in touch with uh, the superintendent of the district we're going to be in. There's going to be about 100 pastors. Our ministry are paying for their travel, their meal, their hotel accommodations, and, and, uh, and of course, uh, we're taking 30 people, five of them, six of them preachers from the area and uh, to do seminars and help them and minister to them. And, uh, and uh, I heard the word Omicron. Of course, I don't know what it means. I think it's a cold that you get for four days and that's about it. And, uh, but it's very transferable. As a matter of fact, it, you know, you, you, when you go to I went to Walmart yesterday, and I'm waiting there in the car for my son to go and get a lot of, a lot of the things that we need for, for the family that came to visit me. And uh, an elderly man came to the entrance of Walmart, knelt down, and just began to pray loud. So I went up there, and he was saying, God, separate me from Mr. Crumb. I don't want him. I ask him to have mercy upon my life in the name of him. I never see anybody kneel down. And, and get and ask God to deliver them from before they go into Walmart. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just uh, thinking about this, uh, uh, about this transferable power. The idea of, of something like a bug that can be so rapid and transfer and act so fast. One of the things that has changed my life is something that I call prophetic power. Now prophetic power is simply a, a say, a way to live, a way to make decisions, a way to look forward toward the future. And as you know, as a small ministry, we have to make those decisions every single day. Uh, it, it's amazing how God can operate within a faith walk that it's exaggerated. That's what prophetic means. It is you call things that be not as though they were. You you live according to what's in front of you, but you don't take a step until uh, God shows up. So I want to tell you two little things that happened to me this week. One was uh, I uh, I have a couch that uh, I bought it for Mary Lucy and the ladies to sleep on while they take care of my wife, and it's got buttons that it get, gets in, makes into a bag. And the back rolls down, you have a bag, and, and you press the button, and it, it, it changes. And so, and I tried to move it, but it, it's about 200 pounds. And I really worked hard on it. I mean, I had, the, I had all kinds of help from dollies to this and that, and I'm there just desperate 
to move their couch. I, 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 my, my house was 5,000 square feet. Mary Lucy bought 50 of each. <laughs> and I had, uh, I had uh, an unbelievable amount of space, 300 closets everywhere. And I was about to give up. I was about to cry and say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? And somebody knocked on my door. It was Kevin and Brenda. And, uh, and of course, they asked me, why, what's going on? And I said, I can't move this couch. So, in the, in the, in Brenda made a call. And a man showed up with more muscles than I ever seen anybody with. And that man, uh, along with the five of the boys, one is over here, they moved that couch <laughs> like it was 50 pounds and, and into the condo here on, on, on Jimmy Daniel. And, uh, and it was just, just, just like a miracle. This last week, if, uh, my birthday was the first, so on the, on the 31st, I got up in the morning and there's no hot water <laughs> and there's no heat. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So I called Jerry. He gave me the number. I thought it would be yours. But it ended up to be Dennis Flanagan. And Dennis came in and he uh, walked down there and uh, made a little movement in there. And, and then he said, Luis, you don't have any gas. This is all gas. And uh, I'm sorry, but you have to call the company. Well, we got to call the company. They told us that they will come on the 5th of January. Well, on the 31st at 3 o'clock, I had uh, five grandchildren coming. That's five grandchildren and, 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 and my two boys and, and their wives. So, <laughs> I was just desperate. And for some reason, Flanagan made a prayer on my heel, my water heel. And, uh, at 12 o'clock, he, he left at 10.30, at 12 o'clock, gas showed up. Sir, sure, I'm going to turn it on for you. And that was it. Now, the two incidents simply means that the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of power, the strength of God, delivered my basket full of goodies from the kitchen at uh, exactly at uh, the time when I needed to move the couch. And when I called uh, Dennis Flanagan, he came in and he just tapped on it. And the company moved. I was supposed to be number 36. I ended up to be number one. Okay. And the whole place was fixed. Now what really happened? Well, see, the power of God is transferable to a need. The power of God is transferable to whatever it is. And so this morning I want to share with you about that because I want to tell you how I live. I use this all the time. I use this in terms of travel. I use this in terms of parking at the Atlanta airport. I mean, I actually expect God to have my space when I get there and I call him to me and I act like the men from Walmart, lift my hands and kneel on the floor. I do some strange things that people say is a little too much, but he's done good for me. <laughs> and so, uh, transferable power is seen throughout the Old Testament. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, it says this, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hand upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So, Joshua received something from Moses. It was the imposition of hands and the spirit of wisdom came upon him. So the question is, if Amicron can be so painful and get, get you a cold and, and be passed on to you, can the Holy Spirit be transferable? It, it, does God operate in that area in terms of actual living, doing things that you need to be done? Well, I want to tell you, uh, I, I don't know if I ever survived the last 52 years as a full-time pastor, a minister, and the Lord, without annuity means, means retirement, uh, means, means salary, uh, means money for the conference. I served free of charge for 52 years. Never had a need that God didn't meet. Never had anything that, that, uh, that uh, 
uh, heard us. God provided abundantly and watched over me in, a, in, a, in an unbelievable way. Now what happened? What, how did I get that faith in me? Who transferred it? Well, my dad did. My dad prayed for me before I left Brazil in the night of 19, 1960, July the 3rd at 11 o'clock in the evening. He put me on a plane with one main ticket to New York City. Nowhere, nobody waiting for me, but his prayer still echoes in my mind. And I could hear my dad uh, just a, a, a man of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, by the power of your Spirit, Lord, this evening I give to you my son to that great nation in America, God. They gave me Jesus. I give him my son. And I ask you, Lord, to empower him with the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, God. And he began praying the Spirit and loud and clear. And people began doing the sign of the cross all over him. And, uh, and uh, that prayer still working on me today. In 2 Kings chapter, 2 Kings chapter 2, that's interesting, and I'm, I'm going to be in preaching, I'm not going to go on with all this, but there's also a man who wanted something from another man. And he really, and the, and the story begins, Elijah does something. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too, King James, stood by the Jordan. So you're talking about 50 men looking. Uh, I want to pay attention to the 50 men because what God is going to do now, He is going to uh, do something through Elijah. In verse 8 says, And Elijah took his mantle, his clothing, wrapped it together, smote the waters, and they were divided hither and tighter, so that they too went over on dry ground. Now the 50 did not go into dry ground, they saw it. Question is, is it transferable when you are present? Yes, it is. Now, I've been, I've been a member of this church, I don't know, maybe five years or four years or ten years, just when Jerry got here, Mary Lucy and I came in. Now, Jerry begins to move, he sits back here, and then he sort of goes down here and he makes an invitation. Now, the invitation is that whatever God given Jerry, is about to be given out. When, when, when Jerry begins to invite, and he is get up front to be invited, and then he comes back, it's a moment in which the transference of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit is upon him. It is transferable to you. Meaning, all you have to do is to come from there to here, because this represents the Holy of Holies. The, 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 the curtain was right there in the, in, the, in the Solomon Temple. And over there is the holy place. So when Jerry begins to move, I don't know if you noticed, he never comes from here to here. He comes from there to here. And then if there's people here, he goes on. But very seldom he comes this way. Why is that the case? It's because the Holy Spirit of God, at the moment when God is anointing him and he heard the Holy Spirit and he heard the music, then that's when the blessing comes. That's when the Holy Spirit comes. And if you have a request of any kind, it doesn't matter if it is a broken, broken refrigerator, if it is a, a business situation, if it is a decision, then God is going to impart. So, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what you shall do for you, I do for you, before I'm taken from you. And Elisha and said, I pray you give me a double portion of your spirit. Now, the catch is here is that the only way he could get that is if he saw Elijah going up. So what does that mean? It simply means that you have to be present. In terms of Joshua, it took the imposition of hands. In terms of Elijah, in Elisha, he had to see it. So it requires a little bit from you and I. It's a requirement. In other words, God don't want to simply just uh, give you something you don't want. That is the, the essence of the altar ministry. 
I took a lady to Brazil that drunk a fifth of whiskey every single day. And on the airport, she said to me, if, I, if I'm not healed, I am going to die. Because I am addicted to that and I can't get out of it. And of course, you know, in these situations, I just let the people do whatever. I don't go there and start praying with her. I just uh, stay back and watch the Lord do things. And as, I, as we stay in line, about 30 of us in a straight line, and the congregation is packed with people, three or four hundred of them packed and gym packed, a lady came out and she had a tight pair of pants. I noticed that because it was uncomfortable to me just to look at it. I mean, I mean, might as well just squeeze the blood out of it. And so she came in and, and she, knelt, she, she, she stood up and the lady was praying for her. And as she prayed for her, the woman that came from the congregation lost her balance and fell on her knees and began to cry. Now, the crying there simply meant, I give up. You don't have to cry, but we come into a time. I gave up this week several times. I mean, I just simply said, Lord, who gave the money for my wife to buy so much? <laughs> I'll probably pay for it. And, uh, and, uh, and so I'm up there at 11 o'clock, you know, I want to purge the house myself. I want to purge every single piece. I want to give away every single piece. And, and I began to just, uh, just broke down. When the woman came up and broke down, the Holy Spirit is ministering to her. Now, what is the alcoholic lady has anything to do with it? All she had to do is to take her hands and put on the head of this lady and say, God, just like you're healing her, would you please heal me? I told her to do that. Just as she is being healed, would you please, in, in her knees back up. Now, I'd say I'd have maybe 50 stories just like that. Some unbelievable stories of healing that occurred in all of these 52 years that Nervous and I travel. What I'm saying to you is that the requirement for you to do, it's not much. It's, it's, it doesn't take much. It's just, just, a, just, a, just a little bit. It's not much. Just a little bit. And so I want you to remember when Jerry begins to move from there to here. And, and he stays back here waiting. He is in a position to give. When he moves from here to there, he is now pushing because you didn't come. In other words, the Holy Spirit is more here under the anointing of the holy place than he is out there when he's begging. I'm not saying begging. He's just reaching out to you. He's just saying to you that the presence of God is upon me. I prayed all day. My body, I can feel the presence of God. But you don't do something about it. I want to tell you this because as a 78-year-old evangelist, I can see these things. I mean, God made me this way to see it. And uh, God taught me this way to see it. So since we have a very private morning this morning, I, wanna, I want you to keep that in your heart. If there's a need that you can't handle, get out of the seat and come. And so, now, and so, the same thing happened with Jesus. The ascension at the Mount of Olives had to happen so they would be able to see it. And they saw him moving up. Now that is just not denied, not being involved. They were right there when he went up. They just, and of course, the two angels responded to them. So prophetic power is transferable. The power of God is transferable. It, it's something that is automatic. Prophetic power carries miracle power in it. Let me ask you this morning. Do you sense the presence of God when you begin to pray? Do you sense the presence of God when you begin to pray? And as you extend prayer in more than 15, 20 minutes, God begins to do wonderful things. 
and I'm expecting tomorrow morning that he will already make the decisions for me. See, tomorrow morning I have a, a decision to make. Does the group travel on the 14th to Cusco? Or the group stays until March uh, and, not, not, and not move? Now, I've been praying today that the Lord will make the decision for me. Uh, the chairman of the board called me, and five, six people from Atlanta already called me, and I don't care what they say. Uh, in other words, if I'm a spiritual leader of that bunch, I want the Lord to tell me clearly, specific to me, and I don't want to run and depend on somebody else. I want to know that He is, he is with me, that He is going to bless that trip, He's going to anoint that trip. And so, uh, just like uh, Elijah and Elisha, I'm this morning just looking to that. So what is really the prophetic? The prophetic is, is an utterance of faith that moves before you doubt, before you fear, before you ask questions. Prophetic is, is calling things that be not as though they were. Prophetic is see it, believing, and knowing that God is present. Prophetic is uh, revealing what's there. One man from a, a church in Atlanta called me and said, I've been employed for about uh, five years, Rick. I run the Olympics in 19 whatever in Atlanta, but now nobody wants my services. And so I said, you've been praying, so I've been praying. And so we prayed together. And during the prayer, I sensed something very odd. Now that's when I, I really, really can flunk or win one of the two because it was something odd, something totally out of order. Uh, it's not acceptable that I have to ask that question. And so that's where the prophetic comes in because I noticed that fear came upon me. I'm not going to say that to this man. Come on now. Come up with some other idea helping him. And what I heard was in your house, Right in the living room, there are four candles, and there's skulls at the bottom of the candles. You bought in, in, in China as an art piece to resell and make money. And he began to cry. Now that is an indication that I got, got it right. It was perfect. So it's all done. It, it's all done. Now you probably say, Rick, but are you going to hear these things? Uh, how do I hear it? Well, you, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to show you that which God wants to reveal. It comes in, in sections. It comes in, in, in moments, in little pieces. As you try, as you pray for others, as you, as you live the Christian life, as you, as you struggle to find out, you're involved in situations just like I am. You've got all kinds of decisions every single day in terms of, uh, of life and selling and buying and people and ministry and relationships and, and, and Walmart, whatever. And so at that particular moment, I asked him, would you bring to me all of it? He said, Rick, I have a lot. I said, what do you mean? I have just uh, at least 50 pieces. And I said, I have, and I have inner graphics, which are, which are, comes in rows and you turn, it's all Chinese. I said, you have that in your house? He said, yes. Do you know what it says? No. I said, bring it in. And as soon as I, I, I he brought it in, in the trunk of his car, I called my Japanese connection, and he came in, my Chinese connection, and he began to read what's there. And I can't tell you what was there. I can't tell you what he read. It was just not permissible to read from a pulpit anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we put it through the garbage can. We cleaned it up. And I asked him to anoint the whole house with oil. I've asked him to turn, to, to throw water all over that which was unclean in his car. And he asked me the question, Rick, why throwing water is necessary? And I told him, in the sanctuary of, of Solomon, there were 40 basins of water. And there was a large brazen of water that fit the size of this sanctuary. In the consecration of the priests, every single piece that was part of the sanctuary of Solomon 
The, the humongous, glorious sanctuary had to be sprinkled with water. When Elijah, Elijah uh, Ezekiel looked at the people coming out of the uh, Babylon, he said, I will throw water upon you and you shall be clean. And that scripture came upon my mind. It just came upon my mind. I don't know why, but it came upon my mind at that specific moment. And so, so the prophetic, you read the scriptures, then you begin to see that throwing water upon the unclean, it's a sign that God used all. He instructed the priests to go inside of the, of the, of the, of the sanctuary of Solomon, the beautiful, the beautiful temple of Solomon, and sprinkle water upon every single piece except the Ark of the Covenant. Everything else had to be sprinkled with water. What is, what is, what is he doing there? Because he's going to bathe the priests with water also. But I'm talking about bathing a priest with no clothing, and the priest would come and throw water on him and clean and wash him and then clothe him perfectly in order to be in the presence of God. What does God is asking? Is that mentally, psychologically, spiritually, we can be in a polluted world. We can be in a, to a digital Babylon that is filthy to the core. I mean, I have to hire somebody to come into my house to purge my TV from everything that needs to get out of there so I can see what I can see. And I don't want that in my house. You see, the level of spiritual and, and blessings of God require from us a desire to be holy. And when we begin to desire to be holy, He will show you what displeases Him and what blesses Him. He will show you what, uh, uh, how to come in into the, the, the presence of the Lord. You see, the Holy Spirit is transferable at a high speed. There's no Omicron, there's no covenant that is more effective, more rapid, more fast than the presence of the Holy Spirit. It has no comparison. Iguana crown and all of this is evil, 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 evil. Curse it, curse it. A man came to my office in desire for me to help him with his business. I, uh, I told him that uh, he needed to put oil in the center of the house, uh, of his house. And so he put oil in the center of his house and he opened all the windows. And he consecrated the house unto the Lord. He consecrated the car unto the Lord. He consecrated the business unto the Lord. He consecrated the kitchen unto the Lord. He just porched and blessed every piece in there. Everything changed in his mind. He called me and said, I've, uh, I've, uh, I never thought that, uh, that God, that the devil could break a refrigerator so many times. I never thought that uh, a car could be broken so many times. I went into a condo that never been blessed because everything doesn't work. And I'm in the process. This morning I had no lights again. No lights. And so I went into the board and I picked up a bottle of oil and I just poured all over the place as you can and I hit it hard. <laughs> and you know something? The lights came back. In other words, transferable power is applicable to everything that you do, everything that you are. In other words, I live in a bubble that is the Lord helping me to live. Now think about this. Here I am at 78 years old, married for 52 years, single. I tell you, there's a woman from Atlanta sending me all kinds of emails. She discovered that I'm single. I don't know. I'm in the world. And so, I'm asking the Lord to keep me pure. I'm asking the Lord to help me to overcome. I'm asking the Lord that I, that I be able to continue. And, 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 in other words, I, uh, I'm just telling you things I do. I don't know if it's helping you or not, but, uh, but every time I write a check to the church, I put a little oil on the tip of the right side. And, uh, and I don't write and run, I just write, put a little oil, and I put my hand on it. I say, God, multiply this money for the glory of God, for my church. Bless the Lord. That's my tithe money. You understand? I've been tithing 80%. 80%. In other words, 
Our ministry operates on 20%. We tithe, we give 80%. I want to pray with you. And I ask you just repeat after me, and I think it's about time to go home. Would you say, Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father. I ask you, Lord, ask you. that you help me to live holy before your presence. Evil will, Evil will come. Sin will come. But I want to resist it. I belong to you, God. Everything that I have, you've given me. And so in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, that as I see my pastor, I let him pastor to me. As, as I see business, I ask you to show me what to do. As I see people, that I'll be able to deal with them effectively. And I ask you that the Holy Spirit of God be transferred with my life to every need that I have. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. I'm going to close this up. Amen.